not out of print, which we knew, and so it'll be in the bookstore next week if you haven't found a copy elsewhere. Today we're going to look at our couple of uh, short stories by Garcia Marquez, Gabriel Garcia Marquez. Y we are going to go on, as you know, our next text will be his famous novel, 100 Years of Solitude. So we're going to spend three weeks now with Garcia Marquez. Colombian writer, Nobel Prize in 1982. This novel was, well, the novel that we'll read was first published, 100 Years of Solitude, in 1967, and was his first big novel. So just to give you a sense of him as a human being, he's uh, 73 years old. He's lived in Mexico City for 25 years. He's very connected to Colombia but he, he doesn't live there. He lives in Mexico City. And he continued after these early short stories to write not only his famous novel that we'll read, but other famous novels, Love in the Time of Cholera, um, Chronicle of a Death Foretold. His first volume of his autobiography came out about a year and a half ago, and it's splendid, called Living to Tell the Tale. So Garcia Marquez is kind of monumental, <coughs> magical realist and monumental fiction writer uh, of the last half of the 20th century century and the beginning of the 21st. So we're going to start with two little stories that I consider to be perfect short stories. I hope you love them. Uh, <laughs> if not, uh, we'll, we'll hope that you do by the end of uh, things. But let's start with A Very Old Man with Enormous Wings, that wonderful subtitle, A Tale for Children. We're going to leave that till the end, that subtitle. But if you had to say, and now I'm going to ask you to participate in discussion because it's too boring for, for me and for you just to listen to the sound of my voice. If you had to say, well, first of all, would somebody be willing, and I'll learn your names this way, uh, to give us a plot summary of this story in three or four sentences? The plot's very simple. Tell me your name, please. And you have to push that little button. My name's Richard. Hi, Richard. And um, they find... Um, they being a family in, I guess it's the winter time, mm -hmm. and um, they find a, a man with, a very old man with enormous wings, like caught up in the mud, and then they allow him to live in their shed, I guess, and determine he's an angel, and people come around and throw rotten food at him, and he sits there forever, and they think he's going to die, and then he sprouts some new feathers and flies off. Thank you. And I left off out the spider <coughs> with the head of a woman. <laughs> yeah, he left out the carnival part because this guy is a spectacle, right? This, this angel, or is he a hawk, or is he an airplane, or is he a sidereal bat? We're going to look at that. But thank you, Richard. That's a great plot summary. He comes, this odd creature, and he leaves. Now, what's so magical real about that? Let's just look at some of the fabulous lines. This is a wonderful translation by Gregory Rabassa. Garcia Marquez has had great luck with his translator, uh, translators into English. Um, but I'd just like to look, look at a couple of these pieces that, that Richard has uh, introduced for us about this flesh and blood angel. Richard, let me just ask you one question. You said they determine he's an angel. Is that the case, or do they continually question what he is? Do you, do you do you want to amplify that phrase that you used? Um, I guess it's under speculation, but they have um, 
I guess, so-called authorities come out to give their opinion Yeah, and well. who are those authorities? Help us out a bit here. If I had to say what this story is about thematically, I'd say it's about conjecture. It's about what the heck is this thing? So tell us about the authorities. It's, a hist it's hysterical. It's a parody of a whole lot of authorities, right? Um, it's too there's old. There's Father Gonzaga. Yes, exactly. The religious fellow is the, religious the priest. Fellow. Is the <laughs> and, um, and what does he say? Remember? Right? Look at the middle of 205. This is a pa long paragraph, and the word conjectures is four lines down there. We're getting all of these supposed experts. So tell us, Richard, would you, do you mind if I continue to ask you to help us no, out? No, um, tell us about this parish priest. Push the button. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so he got there, and they're all talking about what's going to happen to him, Yeah. I guess. And... Um, uh, th he didn't think he was um, an angel because he smelled really bad yes. and uh, had all of the attributes of a human, of a mortal. Yes, that's right. Yeah. So, but th does that stop the religious question? No. Remember, they send to Rome then, and they ask Rome, which is funny. But let's just read some of the lines together. The language is so beautiful. The verbal surface, as I call it, is is stunning. And when we think of this as, as a work in translation, well, Rabasa is a fabulous translator, so we can't forget him, Gregory Rabasa, uh, as part of this art object. Um, look a quarter of the way up from the bottom of 205. The parish priest, do you see the sentence that begins, the parish priest had his first suspicion of an imposter when he saw that he did not understand the language of God. Now, what is that? That's Latin. Here comes the priest to this village and speaks Latin to check out if this is an angel or not. He doesn't understand the language of God or know how to greet his ministers. He didn't pay proper obeisance to the priest. It's all a sentence like that's hysterically funny. Then he noticed that seen close up, he was much too human. He had an unbearable smell of the outdoors. The backside of his wings were st was strewn with parasites, and his mane feathers had been mistreated by terrestrial winds, and nothing about him measured up to the proud dignity of angels. Think of the Baroque paintings of angels, these glorious beings that are diaphanous. They're almost transparent. And here we have an old man with parasites on his wings. So um, the, the contrast is wonderful. Then he came out of the chicken coop and in a brief sermon, the priest warned the curious against the risks of being ingenuous, being taken in. He reminded them that the devil had the bad habit of making use of carnival tricks in order to confuse the unwary. He argued that if wings were not the essential element in determining the difference between a hawk and an airplane, they were even less so in the recognition of angels. That again, so, so funny. Of course we know that they, all of these things have wings, but we can tell the difference between a hawk and an airplane. But says the priest, that doesn't mean, therefore, just because he has wings that he's an angel. We have to be very careful about this. So then, if you just skip down to the bottom of 207, that nice paragraph continues at the, the full paragraph at the bottom of 207. <laughs> Father Gonzaga held back the crowd's frivolity with formulas of maidservant inspiration while awaiting the arrival of final judgment on the nature of the captive. But the mail from Rome showed no sense of urgency. They spent their time finding out if the prisoner had a navel, mean as he born of woman, if his dialect had any connection with Aramaic, presumably the language of Christ, how many times he could fit on the head of a pin, that's very funny, or whether he wasn't just a Norwegian with wings. Those meager letters might have come and gone until the end of time if a providen providential event had not put an end to the priest's tribulations. And what is that providential event? We get some miracles. We get, of course, this carnival that grows up around the, the angel. Look at a phrase, look at several phrases, and I can read them to you rather than telling you where they are. We, there's, there are some nice fra phrases that are giving us a kind of nutshell view of the problem here. Is, and this is typical, this is our first thing to see that's typical of magical realism. Two or more contradictions can be held at once and at the same time, and we don't have to decide. Indeed, we cannot decide which is true and real and which is not. This is one of the subversive aspects of magical realism, that there is not a certainty 
now we can say this is a comic story and we don't need to call it subversive or, or make too much of it, but what he's doing here is giving us a little object lesson, I think, in what magical realism is. We have human on one, we have angel here, therefore we have earth and we have heaven, we have life and death, we have all sorts of oppositions that are either or propositions in Western thinking, but in magical realism there's a tendency to say there are lots of interpretations that can be true at once and they can be contradictory one to the other. So this, this issue of the logic of wings or the flesh and blood angel, there are so many phrases like this that I, that I love. Um, but especially a flesh and blood angel. That's what we've decided. But there's one sentence, it's on the sheet I handed out today that I want you to look at in particular, which epitomizes this aspect of magical realism. It's on the bottom of 206, no, 205, I believe. Would you turn to the, 206, sorry, 206, yes. It's the very bottom sentence, the last sentence that starts on the bottom of 206. And if you don't have the story in front of you, by the way, make sure to, to uh, look on because in an English literature class, what we care about is the meaning, the themes, but we care about the art object itself. And that's what this is. Those words deployed on the page are like brush strokes of a canvas. So anyway, we're gonna always pay a lot of attention to the text. Look at the bottom of 206. Here's the sentence that gives us this beautiful aspect of magical realism that contradictory truths can be, contradictory things can be true at once. It's not either or, it's both and. At first, they tried to make him eat some mothballs, which according to the wisdom of the wise neighbor woman, were the food prescribed for angels. But he turned them down just as he turned down the papal lunches that the penitents brought him. And here we go. They never found out whether it was because he was an angel or because he was an old man that in the end he ate nothing but eggplant mush. Great sentence. But they never found out. So, and we didn't have to. Because look at the very end of the story. What happens? You'd think at the end, you know, a realistic story would give us some conclusion. And indeed, you know, there's been a terrible movie made of this story. They make a great deal of the carnival of the Spider-Man and so forth. But they show the old man <coughs> taking off his wings. That's the opposite of magical realism. They made a realistic movie, as comic as the movie is, out of this magical realist story by giving up the both and and making it either or. They show that he's got these false things on and he takes off his wings and there are his hands. Big mistake. <laughs> um, look at the very end. We're out, aren't we? You know, this, this, this miracle, this odd self has become normalized, regularized, right? And at the end, I mean, we don't expect the end in a way because what does he do? He grows, as Richard has mentioned, new feathers, starts sprouting new feathers, and then he, he, he leaves. But look at the, the gorgeousness of the sentence. She's out, Elisenda is out uh, gathering a bunch of onions. That, those onions are going to be important to us in a minute. She's out gathering a bunch of onions for lunch when a wind seems to come up. That's the middle of the last paragraph, page 210. It's a wind seemed to come up from the high seas and blew into the kitchen. She went to the window and caught the angel in his first attempts at flight. They were so clumsy that his fingernails opened a furrow in the vegetable patch, and he was on the point of knocking the shed down with the ungainly flapping that slipped on the light and couldn't get a grip on the air. That slipped on the light and couldn't get a grip on the air. But he did manage to gain altitude. Elisenda let out a sigh of relief for herself and for him when she saw him pass over the last houses, holding himself up in some way with the risky flapping of a senile vulture. She kept watching him even when he was through cutting the, she was through cutting the onions. She kept on cutting the onions, notice that. Uh, and she kept, and kept on watching until it was no longer possible for her to see him because then he was no longer an annoyance in her life, but an imaginary dot on the horizon of the sea. He's an imaginary dot 
well, is he real? Was he ever real? That utter unwillingness to reconcile contradiction. We don't know at the beginning who he is, and we don't know at the end. So there's something wonderful about, and we could say, well, what's the opposite of this? The realistic novel, perhaps. But think of the detective story. That's, that's the most realistic form of the novel. It depends, everything depends upon causal connection of events that lead to a conclusion. And the conclusion is who the murderer is. That's why we love Agatha Christie. It's hyper-plotted, super-plotted, and super-and-oriented. We read because we want to find out who did it, right? This is the opposite of this, this kind of story. This story, we well, could say it's a little bauble, and it is. And indeed, 100 Years of Solitude ends with a bang, you'll see, if you haven't read it. But here, this, this willingness to leave open various possibilities. We didn't, Richard, talk about the conjecture of the five-star general, the conjecture of the people who thinks he, sh they, he should be made mayor of the universe, you know, the old man, and the five-star general, I've forgotten. Just look one more time at all of these conjectures about this, this, this being, this creature, this flesh and blood angel. It's just, it's just fun. Ah, uh, yes, it's, the conjectures start on 205. It's four lines down from the top full paragraph on 205. The simplest among them thought that he should be named mayor of the world. Others of sterner mind felt that he should be promoted to the rank of five-star general in order to win all wars. Some visionaries hoped that he could put, be put to stud in order to implant a race on earth, a race of winged wise men who could take charge of the universe. And then we get into Father uh, Gonzaga and the religious question. So we have lots of experts, including the wise neighbor woman who knows that <coughs> angels eat mothballs. So, so we have lots and lots of expertise and absolutely no conclusions to be drawn in, in the end. So that's number one of the three things I want to look at as characteristics of magical realism. Anybody want to bring up issues about this story that we haven't, that's kind of a rush through? What other things did you notice that we haven't? What about the characters? That's number two, point number two. What about Elisenda, for example? She's out cutting onions, we know that. She's, they build a mansion with balcony and so forth. Uh, with the money that they've earned on this spectacle, this carnival spectacle. Are they, yes, would you tell me your name? Morgan. Morgan. I you have to push the button. I'm sorry, That's Morgan. Okay. I thought it was very interesting how she thought that the angel was more of a burden than anything. And in contrast, angels are supposed to be good things yes. that are brought to watch out for you and look over you. and. My favorite part in here was when she shouted that it was awful living in the hell full of angels. In the, in the what of angels? It says, she, at the bottom of 209, yeah. it says that she shouted it was awful living in that hell full of angels. <laughs> that's, that's great. Yeah, yeah. So she has a certain personality, and it's surprising that she's burdened by this angel, you know, the idea of an angel visiting. We have thousands of thousands, hundreds of thousands of paintings of Mary, for example, being visited by the angel Gabriel, the Annunciation when she's told, and it's always a moment of great, of great joy and so forth. So he's playing with the conventions is what he's doing, Morgan, in my view here. He knows that anyone who has an, uh, you know, a mystical vision is considered in the Catholic tradition to be graced, of course, and so he's, he's making her into, into the opposite of that. What about the husband? Do we get a sense of him at all? Pelayo? Let me ask the question another way. Is this psychological fiction? Thank you. What do you have to say about that, Chris? Just give us a little insight here. Well, the, the characters are there to, to ask questions, yes. and no one's there to answer them. Mm -hmm. The characters are static, and the only dynamic force in this story uh, could possibly be imaginary. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and dynamic force is uh, imaginary in the sense that the community is trying to imagine what this figure is. Is that what you mean by imaginary dynamism? Well, like the only character that changes throughout the story, you have a crippled angel. 
yeah. and then you have the scrutiny of what an angel is or what you know the best possible person is or, yeah and then you have all your means of defining what a good person is coming in to define what it is but yeah. not answering it yeah and then the ideal good person flies away without ever knowing whether it existed or not yeah that's and it but it, it had the yeah. change of, of of being crippled and then flying away but still without reach you know yeah yeah if we had any sense of the psyche of the angel we might say oh he overcame his obstacles or he you know took holistic remedies and his fleas or whatever they were <laughs> got better I've forgotten mites or whatever um, but basically there is no interior developed interior life here now now, that's not true of all magical realism, but what, where does the magic come from? It comes from the situation. So there's a kind of s magical setting or set of circumstances. That's not always the case with all of the magical realism. We'll see. But mo most of the magical realism we'll see, no, that's not true. <laughs> Some of it, and especially Garcia Marquez, he takes character out of the mix. He takes our character as we know it from the realistic. No, but we cry salt tears when, you know, when, when we, well, let's see, when do we cry salt tears? Um, when we read James Agee's Death in the Family, oh my goodness. Um, but we don't have to, to even cry salt tears. We identify with characters. Did anybody really identify with these characters? No. Um, it's, it's, so one of the things about magical realism is it resituates character. And it's contesting, I think, magical realism, contesting the importance of the individual psyche. What's more important here? It's the communal psyche. This is a com about community. It's about lots of people who have different things, but it's how a community reacts to this odd and, if not miraculous, at least magical event. So there's a resituating here, not only of the causal linear structure of narrative realism, Think of Agatha Christie. You can't have two contradictory things that true at once in <laughs> Agatha Christie. She has to figure out which is true and which isn't. And she does that because she's rational. You know, the rational logic of, of, of the detective story we can take, or Scarlet Letter, Huck Finn, The Great Gatsby. Think of your favorite realistic novel. And it's very important to have a plot that is linear. Ultimately, you can't have a garden of forking paths, uh, one of the stories by Borges that we'll read later on. So this is a kind of garden of forking paths. Lots of possibilities. None are privileged at the end, except that we know that he flies off and he becomes an imaginary dot. I don't know what an imaginary dot is. <laughs> but. Um, We'll have to imagine an imaginary <laughs> dot at the at the end of the story. So, so there's a resituating of of plot causality. By causality, I mean if then. We all live according to cause. If you work hard in this class, you're going to get a good grade. If I work hard on my book, it'll get published. That kind of, kind of thing. We're very causally oriented. If then, if then, and that's fine. We're we're an orderly society, and one needs that kind of causal linkage. You know that con there are consequences to actions. Often there are in in magical realism too, but there's a resituating of that privileging of logical <coughs> causality and that privileging of individual psychology. And we see them both here. And then one third thing, I mean one th more thing, three. The third thing that I'm interested in in this story and in the one we'll talk about next is the um, importance of stuff. Those onions, I told you they'd be important. <laughs> the phenomenal world, the, by phenomenal I mean phenomena, I mean things that we can touch and taste and smell and so forth, is privileged. There's lots and lots of realism in magical realism. So don't think that it's like sci-fi where everything is um, somehow other than the world as we know it and the world as realism presents it to us. So that she's gathering a bunch of onions. Garcia Marquez is saying she could just have been out in the garden, but he no. He, he wants us to smell those onions. He wants us to think about onions for lunch. Hmm, I wonder how those are served, you know, <laughs> sliced maybe or uh, creamed. So, so there's, there's a great emphasis. And uh, you, the description of parasites, that's the word. I couldn't think of what he had on his wings. So the description of parasites on the back of his wings that they smell and so forth. So don't think that magical realism is ethereal or um, diaphanous in the same way that Baroque angels are. It's down to earth and 
it's often super political. I don't think this story is terribly political. Does anybody want to make this an allegory of political something or other? Anybody want to read it that way? Yeah, Chris, give us a The shot. church, of course, in there. Yeah. Let me see the church. Yeah. It's, there, there's parody there. I guess that's what I'd say, parody, P-A-R-O-D-Y. Um, there's a parody of church. There's a parody of all knowing, of all knowledge. Is that, would that be where you'd go with that? Yeah, that, with just the, that the sorts of questioning are inquisition, but still the lack of an answer. Just, it, it's, it's the same thing with the politics, like 100 years. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a good point. Yes, I, I wasn't going to go to the political, but the parody will, um, will, will give us some of that. So, so um, if I had to say how this is a political story, I'd say it's subversive of narrative realism. And narrative realism is a Western form that carries with it all sorts of ideological um, characteristics, some of which we've just mentioned, linear causality, psychic, psych privileging of the individual psyche over the co community, community, though not always. Again, all of these are just uh, attempts to make generalizations which can always be contested in good magical realism form. Let me just get my little note cards here and see if there's anything else I wanted to say about this story, which I'm... I think, as I said, is a perfect story and perfectly translated. So, um, oh yeah, well, one other thing, but this we don't see so much here. The unsettling of temporal relationships. We're going to see that more in <coughs> others of our stories, the chronology that jumps back and forth. So, yes, ma'am, Norma. Um, I just wanted to say that when I was reading the short story, um, I was thinking of an old video from REM. It's called Losing My Religion, and it shows an older man with wings, and ah. he's fallen. And oh my goodness, so does good. anybody else, are you familiar with that? I'm, I'm not. Thank you, Norma. And Norma's going to be our Spanish consultant because she's reading some of the text, maybe not this one. I went to my, I have the Spanish at home, I wanted to see how a couple of those beautiful phrases are, are in Spanish, but she's in several occasions will help us with, because we're going to be reading all of our Latin American work, of course, in translation, and you can never forget that there's a human being who's an intermediary between you and and the, the original. We often forget, you, you notice book reviews in the Houston Chronicle, they drive me crazy there. There'll be translations and it won't be thought to, to put the translator's name down. I thought to me that, I, I guess I've done some translating at some point or other and it just, it's a, I quit doing it, it's too hard, too hard. <laughs> too many small decisions, I, I, all those words you have to choose. But in any case, um, thank you for that comment. I think with that we can just go on to the next, which is from the collection, The Strange Pilgrims. Garcia Marquez published this without much fanfare, because, and he called it Strange Pilgrims because these were seven or eight stories of his that had been in a drawer someplace. And he said, oh, they're just pilgrims, these stories. And indeed, some of them aren't so wonderful. I mean, I don't think they're as good as his early short stories, but one that I love is this one called Light is Like Water. And I, again, it strikes me as a useful way to begin to deduce some of the uh, aspects of this kind of magical realism, some of the characteristics, and see how this kind of fiction differs from Moby Dick. Uh, so would someone do us the favor of telling us what this story is, a little plot summary. It couldn't be easier. Uh, tell me your name. Kim. Kim, would you do that for us? Yeah. Did you get a chance to read? Like, Yeah, do that for us. Will you, Kim? Okay. Um, these two children, they um, first they want a canoe, and so they promise to do really well in school, so their parents get them a canoe, and then they want um, scuba diving stuff and so while their parents leave on Wednesdays they turn on the lights and it floods the house as like water and so they get to practice their canoe and and diving and everything and then they finally have a party with all their classmates and all the classmates end up drowning. Thank you. Anybody want to add to that? The, the trick is of course is a, the magical real trick is that 
apparently it's said that light is like water. It flows. There are waves and so forth. And so he, what does Garcia Marquez do? He li takes that literally, does he not? And he um, makes a story out of that. It's a kind of interesting approach to, to story read writing. Kim, who's the narrator of this story? How do we get our information here? We didn't talk about the narrator in the last one because there's, it's an omniscient narrator. This one there, it's not quite omniscient. Did you notice the intrusion of a narr narrative I? Who, would you tell me your name? Kathy. Kathy, you noticed. I'll take Kim, I'll take you off the hook. Is that okay? Kathy, tell us. Uh, yeah, I definitely noticed that. Tell uh, us where. Change the eye on page 158. Yep, you got it. Um, it. I thought it was very obvious. Yeah, tell us, that, let's just look at those. It's the last two paragraphs. We're going along, whenever you see an eye intrude like that, um, <coughs> when we're going along um, thinking we're just getting this information, as we often do in fiction, from an authorial voice, or an, uh, we can call that, pr that voice omniscient, because lots of times an omniscient narrator or a narrator will tell us some, some thoughts that a character is having when he or she is alone in his or her room. Well, that's not, you know, you could say realism isn't very real, because, very realistic, because that doesn't happen in real life. But we're used to it, and we, that's the convention of realism, an, an authorial voice or a narrator who knows more than any person usually could know, because often we get interior reality. Um, but here we have this, uh, we, we go along, we think we've got an omniscient narrator, and then Kathy, we get down to the second to last paragraph, correct? Read those last couple for us, will you? Sure. Uh, this fabulous adventure was the result of a frivolous remark I made while taking part in a seminar on the poetry of household objects. Toto asked me why the light went on in just the touch of a switch, and I did not have the courage to think about it twice. Light is like water. The tap and out it comes. Uh -huh. Do we get the eye intruded again at all in the story? No. Mm -mm. So what do we do with that? Who is that eye? It, do it doesn't seem to be the father or the mother who are other characters. Someone taking a class on the poetry of household objects. Remember that our phenomenology of magical realism, that, that importance, and there's a wonderful phrase about household objects flying on wings through the kitchen sky, uh, one of those lines that you want to put on your computer. <laughs> um, tell us what you think about that, Kathy. Do you want to speculate about why Garcia Marquez in gives us an intrusive eye that isn't, really couldn't be the mother or father? I, I really wasn't sure, honestly, but I uh, definitely thought there was a reason. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm not sure either. I mean, does anybody <coughs> want to speculate on how you read that eye? We could say, well, maybe he, I'm sorry, anybody do that for us? Oh, thank you. Tell me your name, please. It's Anne. Anne. Um, I don't know if it's so important that okay. we know who it is, just that yeah. someone told the kids this, and they took it literally. Yeah. And yeah, so someone we have to take it as a literal story. Yeah, yeah, that, that's an interesting point. Thank you. Maybe it doesn't matter who it is, what, but there's a certain authority with that I that we have to accept, yeah. Would you tell me your name? My name is Megan. Um, Megan. I think that in the same way that in the other story there's um, realistic objects mentioned kind of intermittent with mm -hmm. non, with the magical yeah. objects, like the woman with the head of a woman but the body of a spider. Yeah. Um, and the sunflowers <coughs> sprouting from the swords, and same thing. Yeah, those mentioned with miracles, the yeah. and the chicken coop is <coughs> real. Yeah, this kind of brings this real person, this very stable. It's obvious that someone in the household is talking mm -hmm. and has been kind of feeding the boys with this mm -hmm. in the middle of all the other magical. Yeah, stuff. So it kind of grounds it. Yeah. So, so for you, that I not only adds authority but adds reality. Yeah. It's 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 a realistic. Details, so that's why th this could be taken literally and ha happen in a way. Yeah, interesting. Would you tell me your name, please? Uh, William. William. Yes. Not that I'm going to remember all of you, but uh, you'll have to tell me several times. William, please tell. Um, I was thinking maybe, I guess the eyes, maybe it's some sort of teacher that knew uh -huh. the boys and mm -hmm. 
went ahead and he found out eventually like what later on happened he's retelling us the story yeah yeah that's a kind of interesting thought because he is after all or she taking a seminar on the poetry of, of household objects and then this light is like water is I understand what one learns in physics classes I I wouldn't know that for sure but yeah so that so you're kind of reinforcing what Anne was saying about the authority of the figure that I think it's just central here because here we get I, yeah so I I like that theory it hadn't occurred to me but he, he knows he's older he's doing seminar is so, so forth yeah tell me your name please my name is Ruth Ruth um, I thought it was interesting how quickly, like, you're reading in the story, and then you hear that I, totally different point of view, and then you, you're, I'm surprised at how quickly I forgot that, yeah, and went point. right into, yeah. right back into That's the right. story. That is a very good point. That's right. So then you go b into what is the making literal the metaphor, right. the metaphor, or the simile in this case, light is like water. We take that as a poetic figure, as a, a, a way of speaking, if you want. And then what, what we, so, so we see that here, and then we go into that world where it becomes real or magical real. Um, yeah, that's a good point. So, so those are all very interesting points. What I say generally to students when we're, sometimes I teach courses in narrative technique, point of view in the modern novel, one of my favorites. I love unreliable narrators. They're my favorite. You can't trust them for anything. And there's always their eyes, you know, and they're, but they're telling from your point of, their point of view so you don't have an external way of judging until the author starts planting clues that the person is crazy. You, you know, the best for that is Vladimir Nabokov. You must read Nabokov. He's wonderful. Read a novel called Despair. Wonderful. Anyway, what I say generally about an intrusive I, or sometimes an intrusive you, there, there can be you, second person narrators too, um, is that it's a way that the author has of distancing or bringing you closer in. Suddenly it gets your attention, you're in, a, to me this is an accordion effect. We're kind of out there watching as if there were, you know, a, a, that third or what fourth wall is missing. And then when we have that I, it's, we're brought into the, into the conversation in ways that are hard sometimes to specify, but you must be aware of that of that technique and that accordion effect that's possible when when you get the eye. And I like very much your point, Ruth, about <laughs> about forgetting it. It's not like we say, oh gosh, now what happened to that eye and how nerve-wracking it is that we don't know anything about him or her. But still, there's a way that our attention is drawn because we're reading carefully. Yeah, Tracy, tell me. It had kind of like the campfire effect, how someone's storytelling, they're sitting around a campfire, and everybody's listening. There's this man and this woman and these two kids, and they're kind of distanced from the, from the story, like you're saying. Then yeah. all of a sudden, he says, and I was standing there, yeah, and I was there too. Yeah. And so everybody's pulled in. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. I think, finally, if we had to say something general about that kind of intrusive I or you when we're expecting a third person, it would be that. It, there, there's, there's something about, uh, about jogging us, getting our attention. And, um, and, and then in this case, because that I delivers the most important line, which is the title, in fact, of the story, we, we pay particular attention. So thank you. Those are very interesting comments. Um, what, what are we going to do here um, with the end of the story? Let's just take a look at it. What does happen? They do drown, it seems. Kim seems to be correct about that. Is there any other way to read this story? I've just been alleging that uh, magical realism doesn't allow for such finality as that, that they just all go down, uh, the whole class drowns. Let's read the last paragraph together. Anybody want to do us the favor? Anybody's a theater major here? Oh, goody, thank you. What's your name? Oh, well, I'll be real. I was a theater major. Though. But that's all right. I, I'll take it. Thank you. <laughs> that's, uh, would you tell us your name, please? Um, Carlos. 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 OK. OK, wait. Bueno. At the end of the hall, moving with the curtain, clutching the oars with his mask on, and only enough air to reach port. Carlos, start again and read a little louder for us. Oh, sure. Thank you. At the end of the hall, moving with the current and clutching the oars with his mask on, and only enough air to reach port, Toto sat in the stern of the boat, reaching for the lighthouse, and Joel, floating in the prow, still looked for the north star with the sextant. 
and floating through the entire house were the 37 classmates, eternalized in the moment of peeing into the pot of geraniums, singing the school song with words changed to make fun of the headmaster, sneaking a glass of brandy from Papa's bottle, for they had turned on so many lights at the same time that the apartment had flooded, and two entire classes at the elementary school of St. Julian the Hospitaller drowned on the fifth floor of 47 Paseo de Castanea. In Madrid, Spain, a remote city of burning summers and icy winds, with no ocean or river, whose land-bound indigenous population had never mastered the science of navigating on light. Thank you. Yeah. I love the phrase eternalized in the moment. Now, of course, it continues of peeing into the pot of geraniums, which is very funny. But that eternalized in the moment, we're going to see temporal time warps. And that, that's just the beginning of a hint of, of one there, eternalized in the moment. But do, I, is there another way to read it? Somebody, last, the last time I taught this story, had a marvelous counter reading. And now I can't quite remember how it was done, because my reading has been a bit Kim's in that, now but think about if there are other ways to do this at the end. Mine has been to say, well, the literal light is like water, rains at the end, that the light is water and indeed, though it seems impossible that you would flood an apartment and drown in the apartment, that that's what we're told and that's the magical real part of it that can't really happen. But I took it and take it, more or less, to be the case that the, metaf the, the metaphor is made real and therefore the boys and the classes drowned. Anybody read that differently? Yeah, yeah, well, let me hear from you. Tell, would you tell, we've got to push the button and tell me your name. Oh, come up and find a button, please. We want to hear from you. Oh, the whole class had died. You thought it meant, start again, you thought it meant that the whole class had died. Well, that's what we're told. Can that happen? We suspend our disbelief and we figure it does happen, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, so you're reading it a bit like I am and like we're told to read it. What I can't, I'm not sure about is the last sentence. Did I hear your name? Ify, Ify Tayo. Ify Tayo, thank you. Do we call you Ify or we call you Ify Tayo? Ify, you can call me Ify. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> That's easier. Thank you, Ify. Um, yeah, now let's see. Would you tell me your name again? Kathy. No, you're Kathy. <laughs> I'm Megan. Maya. Um, I, I was thinking more along the lines of, um, I know that when I've spent a lot of time with kids, and when kids get sort of wrapped up into their actions, mm -hmm. get hot and sweaty and emotional and yeah. crazy, and it's kind of more of an emotional drowning than anything. Yeah. It's more of a, a sinking literal yeah. into whatever you're doing, just to the point of reality is no longer. Yeah. You can't, you literally have to snap them out of that. Yeah. Yeah, okay, that that's, so, so that would be Chris's comment of earlier that what's real here is the imagination, and the, what we imagine is certainly is as real as, as anything else. So, and also that reminds me that we didn't talk about the subtitle, A Tale for Children, of the first story. This one also is a tale for children in that sense, I think, um, by which we mean a release from the, the logic, the causal, the causal logic that we are bound to in Western culture. By Western culture, I mean cultures with roots in Europe, mm -hmm. right? So Europe colonized most of the world. That's what we're going to talk about when we talk about post-coloniality. The U.S. is post-colonial, but it's not. We got rid of the English fathers so easily, so much more easily than the uh, Latin Americans got rid of the Spanish fathers. That and other complications, of course, that um, the post-coloniality of of Latin America differs greatly from that of North America, as you, as you know. And we talk about that in some some classes more than in others, but. In fact, we'll get to it more when we get to our American novels. But Ruth, you had something on your mind too about the final, about the reading here. Yeah, I. Um, to me, it just it doesn't seem possible for it to be, liter like take it literally. Yeah. Um, because there's no sense of sadness. 
uh-huh. of the children dying or yeah. drowning. There's just that. There's no. There's more of like a release. Yeah. Than a than a sadness that these kids are drowning, which you would naturally feel if it was literal. Yeah. So. Okay. okay. And what do you do with that last sentence about Madrid? I, I was speaking of the Spanish fathers. Madrid, obviously, the capital of Spain, inland, right in the middle of Spain, um, with no, of course, land-bound indigenous, I mean, they're, we're told they're land-bound, landlocked would be actually the way I would have translated that, uh, <laughs> um, with their, their population. Is it, in a way, a critique, could that be a critique of the lack of imagination? That these kids, because what you're saying coincides with what Maya's saying. Right. Yeah. That it can't, that, that, so it's a beautiful imagined ending yeah. by these kids. I, I, I do like that because somehow it's very hard to say, well, yes, they drowned, even though light isn't really like water. Um, so, so we're asked to accept the, but do you, do you read, did anybody have a comment about that last, yeah, Kim? Yeah, I did see it as a critique because because they're not the boys are not from from Spain. Yeah, good from point. Cartagena, where Very much. you know it's on the it's on the um, water's edge, and so you know I think they're kind of critiquing maybe part of the culture and everything. And, and it definitely you know it says in Madrid, Spain. Yeah. So definitely it's different. They're the ones with the knowledge. They don't the Toto y Joel don't drown because they have that that. Yeah, because they have an imagination. <laughs> yeah, I kind of like to read the end that way too. And thank you for reminding us that the children are from Cartagena, which is um, the, the coast of Colombia, the Caribbean coast, where Garcia Marquez was born and bred. And if you decide to read his autobiography, as I hope you will, you'll, uh, and we'll read a lot about that part of the country when we read 100 Years of Solitude. So, so I think there is something about this question of being able to accept at the end the both and. They, they both lived and died. They drowned because they can imagine an apartment filled with water at the same time that they uh, didn't drown. So thank you. And thanks, Ruth, too. That was a good, good comment. I think there, the lack of any sense of tragic anything quite the contrary. This moment eternalized while they're peeing in a geranium pot and singing songs making fun of the headmaster and so forth. So, Let me just point to a couple of beautiful sentences. 160, um, it's that wonderful sentence I said that we should put on our uh, computers. Um, it's the middle of the last full paragraph, three quarters of the way down the page. But let's just... Uh, start with the sofa. That's the second sentence in that last paragraph on 160. The sofa and easy chairs covered in leopard skin were floating at different levels in the living room. This is like the onions for lunch. Among the bottles from the bar and the grand piano with its manila shawl that fluttered half submerged like a golden manta ray. Household objects in the fullness of their poetry flew with, flew with their wings. Start again. Household objects in the fullness of their poetry flew with their own wings through the kitchen sky. The marching band instruments that the children used for dancing drifted among the bright colored fish freed from their mother's aquarium, which were the only creatures alive and happy in the vast illuminated march. marsh. Everyone's toothbrush floated in the bathroom along with papa's condoms and mama's jars of creams and her spare bridge, her teeth and the television set from the master bedroom floated on its side, still tuned to the final episode of the midnight movie for adults only. And there's so much specificity there that, um, again, I, one more time, we see this aspect of magical realism, that it's real, real. But again, it's the situation. We don't know much about the psychological, the interior life of these boys. What we know is something about um, their daringness, let's say. There. Yeah, Mia. Um, I was just going to, I think it's interesting that it mentions the household objects in the fullness of their poetry. Again, the class that he was taking yeah. when he mentioned yeah. the boys yeah. and this whole thing started. Yeah. And it seems that children have the best way of taking everyday objects and turning them into something completely different yeah. and not um, recognizing what they're actually supposed to be for, which is like the TV, it says the the television set turned on its side to a movie for adults only. Yeah. They 
they're not even interested in an adults only movie which yeah. everyone else an adult would be if you walked yeah. in and you noticed it you would be yeah. drawn to it yeah so yeah yeah so so what you're saying is it's a, I mean you're reinforcing the point you made earlier that this is a kind of wonderfully imagined world from a child's perspective, even though when you see that household objects one more time and we know that the I narrator, that would confirm your suspicion that it's the same narrator but he just comes out and takes off the mask, his, his uh, let's say the mask of the narrator and says I and then puts it back on and steps back from the story and, and lets the story proceed on its own as it were. But yeah, that's a very interesting point, man. Thank you. Okay, any other comments about this story? Yeah, Norma. Push the little button, will you? Thank you. Uh, going back to the last line, I thought it was, um, I didn't know why he had used indigenous, because I've never heard of mm -hmm. anybody uh, commenting of people from Spain having indigenous population. Yeah. Because sometimes in Spanish, whenever you say, oh, he's an indio, it's almost saying that they're very naive or ignorant almost. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, yeah. I think it's a bad translation is what I think it is. When we speak of Indians, Latin American or North American Indians, what we do is use a Eurocentric term that, of course, as you well know, was a mistake on the early explorers and conquerors' part. They thought they had reached the West Indies, especially Columbus. So he refers to indigenous populations as Indians. We now say, generally, we use the word indigenous. Indigenous doesn't really mean Indian. It means native to the place indigenous and it's not indigent which means poor that's different too so indigenous here is correct but it's confusing because in English we use the word indigenous much more to refer to the indigenous peoples of America meaning what we use and of course in in in, in the, the US we've tended to use the term Native American which so so you're right that indigenous here it's it's by the book correct it means those people from madrid but it, it is it is a confusion for readers that familiar with the use of indigenous in a rather more specific context yeah chris um, would you about, push the button yeah i was thinking about that with the battle of algiers and the movies used. yeah that's interesting yeah because like the expulsion of the jews uh, yeah. from from algiers and then on top of that why that would be pertinent to spain in spain uh, exiling the muslims and the jews and yeah. then the building the light falling from the building uh, hidden among the trees and then the yeah. same with the kids looking at the light underneath the bed as well yeah yeah After all of this we can perhaps we, we we have to risk uh, we risk over reading i think I'm not so good on the Battle of Algiers, the movie. I take it you are. Synopsis. Tell us about that. Well, it's just a documentary by the Algerian government documenting both sides of the uh, the Algerian takeover of the uh, of the government expulsing the the colonialism. Yeah, right. So it's it's a it's a movie about getting rid of the French from Algeria. So it's about colonization in some sense. But I, yeah, yeah. It, See, for those of you that know the movie, that will r resonate with you. So thank you. Uh, yeah, and Tracy? I mean, if indigenous cultures have been pushed out, then surely they have this kind of victorious dream where they go and instead of pushing them, so instead of getting pushed out, they break the light, which is kind of like the imagination, which is why it's so important that he's got a poetry seminar. It's like a, like a bringing out of like the poetic self, the imagination again, yeah. like yeah. the indigenous imagination. And then uh, they overtake instead. Who yeah. are the people that live? Yeah. The two boys. Yeah. And they kill all these, they flood all these people who, <laughs> who had taken them over in the, in the first place. Well, see, now that's an interesting theory because we're told that two entire classes drowned. Right. But <laughs> maybe they did, and, and the boys didn't. I, I, had not, I had not thought to make that distinction. Do you make that distinction? I did. I'm not sure if I read it, if I just assumed it. I took it that everyone, we were to, to understand that everyone drowns, and then we have to try to understand what drowning means in a world where it can't possibly happen that an apartment floods with water enough to drown. So, But I, I like your point about... Um, there's a certain uh, post-colonial discourse going on here under the surface. Yeah, it could well be. I hadn't thought of it. Yeah. Ruth? I have a quick question. At the I end of... I um, can see you. Hmm. Oh. Where are you, Ruth? 
Let's see. I can't. See I can't see <laughs> <laughs> Are you over there? Okay. I think you're going to have to move here next time. If okay, you don't mind. I Thank will. you. Um, but I was sort of confused <laughs> about why they included right at the bottom of um, 160, like the sudden sexuality, like the midnight movie and the Papa's condom. After this huge, you know, story with, with children, and yeah. I just was very confused by that. Yeah. Well, gosh, you guys are close readers. That it hadn't. I just thought it was a f one more funny specific detail, yeah. like the mother's bridge. But clearly, he's choosing. For some little shock value, I guess. I don't know. What do you say? Oh, William's got something back there. Tell us, William. Well, maybe like the, the Papa's condoms and the Mama's jars of creams and the spare bridge maybe it kind of coincides with the fact that they're in exile. Because remember all these stories are about exile. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they so are. I, I've, read, I've read Strange Pilgrims. So oh, great. So Good. I've read all, so I'm familiar with most of those stories. Yeah. And um, maybe it's the fact that you know, maybe in Colombia, maybe like um, condoms and stuff aren't so prevalent. Maybe like in Spain, which is more of a European country, maybe kind of just kind of shows that shows that shows that dynamic of the the Westernized thought with the indigenous thought. With yeah. you know, if we if we play on your idea, uh, Tracy of yeah. of of if if these kids were being flooded, I just kept seeing that this was a this was almost like a critique of the Colombian value of being in Spain and then sharing that. Well, it's very interesting. Yeah. You know, yeah, 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 very interesting. Um, tell us just a little <coughs> bit about the rest of the collection. I've read it too, but do you, do you have some general comments about it? Uh, yeah, the stories are not exactly, a lot of them don't really seem to fall into this magical realism, especially like mm -hmm. this older yeah. stuff. They don't fall yeah. into that. They fall more almost like um, into more, I guess, they, they're very politically bent. Yeah. I remember that. Yeah, very yeah, there. yeah. But less satisfying to me somehow. I, 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 I do believe his comment about the pilgrims being, I hadn't thought about it being thematic. It, 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 it is that. But it's also that he said, well, I called it that because I just didn't know what to do with these stories and then I collected them. Now, that may be pulling our leg, but I do believe that they don't have the kind of quality or coherence of the earlier collection. So, so, but this one in particular, I think, is is great. Other, yeah, please. What is your name? Catherine. Catherine. Um, my name is Catherine. I got a different take on the story altogether. Oh my goodness! I feel like maybe the boys planned all of this because I mean, they planned and it was their goal to mm -hmm. to get the gold gardenia and to get the diving equipment to um, to get the boats. Yeah. And then oh, they yeah, invited all the students over, yeah. and they were the only ones with the diving equipment, ah, with the sand and everything. Ah, so I think that's great. It, yeah, so you I made think it, it into planned. Agatha Christie. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was planned in a way. That's oh, that's great. Because they were the only ones prepared so for it. So it's the revenge of the yeah. colonized <laughs> against the colonizers or something. <laughs> Oh, see, that's where you got your idea. Too. I, yes. boy, so it seemed to me, yeah, that's why they have the rowboat and yeah. the thing. And that's also why when, oh my uh, gosh. That's, uh, really, when they great. talk to the parents and they say that the kids were smart enough to do anything they wanted mm -hmm. to do, they could be the teachers if they wanted to, saying they're smart enough to think about all this. And then they seem surprised when the kids only ask for a party. And they're like, oh, they're maturing. Yeah. So that's not that. That's the <laughs> trick yeah, in the story. Yeah, they have a plan. Yeah. Yeah. How very interesting. Did others of you find that, the, this kind of subtext of the, the uh, child's re children's revenge or, or, or something? On colonialism. <laughs> On colonialism. Very interesting. I, I must say that I was more involved in the magical and less in the political. So good for you. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, thank you, Catherine. That's very interesting. Did everybody follow that argument? Uh, it serves my purposes, and it serves any literature professors or students' purposes in the sense that interpretation is what we love. So I'm glad that um, we have various of them. Okay, let's, shall we stop this and go a little bit to what I've asked you to read from the introduction to my book, which I think it will, will go very quickly. And then we may indeed have time to look really quickly at the handout that I've given you. Would anyone like to, to comment on this introduction? I hope that some of the terminology is not overwhelming. I love the, um, I happened to teach at the time that Wendy Ferris and I were preparing this anthology of essays, 
I happened to teach Julian Barnes' marvelous novel, wonderful novel called Flaubert's Parrot. It's about a, a French critic, no, an English critic who's gone to France. He's a critic, a literary critic, and an expert in Flaubert. And if you know Flaubert, Gustave Flaubert, his famous novel is Madame Bovary. But he has a wonderful, and he has a wonderful short story called A Simple Life. And in that story, there's a parrot. I won't go further than to tell you about that. But put those, you'll find over the course of the semester, I mention a lot of books. I love books, so do you, or you wouldn't be in this classroom. So what I'd like you to do, if you ever feel motivated, is you just keep an ongoing list of uh, never-ending possibilities for reading. So put, if you do that and you want to do that, put um, Flaubert's Parrot by Julian Barnes on that, alongside of the title, in quotes, it's a short story, uh, A Simple Life. It's published under, in, in a little skinny volume by Gustave Flaubert called Three Stories, because they've taken three of his stories. Um, he didn't publish them that way, but you'll find that there's a magical parrot in that story that then Julian Barnes's critic, literary critic, picks up on. Look at the, the quote. It's just funny. We'll start with it. I'll read it. A quota system is to be introduced on fiction set in South America. The intention is to curb the spread of package tour Baroque and heavy irony. Ah, the propinquity of cheap life and expensive principles, of religious banditry, of surprising hu humor and random cruelty. Ah, the daiquiri bird which incubates its eggs on, on the wing. Ah, the Fridona tree whose roots grow at the tips of its branches and whose fibers assist the hunchback to impregnate by telepathy the haughty wife of the hacienda owner. Ah, the opera house now overgrown by jungle. Permit me to rap on the table and murmur, pass. Novels set in the Arctic and Antarctic will receive a development grant. This is, of course, already a parody on 100 Years of Solitude and the kind of magical realism that we're seeing at the outset of this course. By the time Flaubert's Parrot is published, which is, oh gosh, now I'll have to look it up, but it's early 80s, this business of sort of the Latin American Baroque magical reel is getting overdone, according to him. So what Wendy and I do is give it to Barnes. We say, look, we, this, we were, this book came out in 95. We were writing this introduction together on one computer, if you can imagine. We're still friends. <laughs> um, in fact, you'll notice the book is dedicated to friendship. We had a great time. Wendy teaches in Dallas, and so maybe someday she'll come and give us a lecture. You never know. Um, but we decided that we just say, OK, Barnes, you're right. A lot of this kind of, you know, the the sores, the, those miracles that are listed of the angel, the sores that have the sunflowers growing out of them, that kind of overdone, overripe, magical realism. But of course, we don't want to give it to him too completely. So let me just keep reading here a little bit, and then we'll get past the beginning. We say, Barnes has got it just right. His parodic pastiche of magical realism moves back and forth, as do so many of the literary texts we consider here, between the disparate worlds of what we might call his, the historical and the imaginary. Well, duh. <laughs> magical realism is just that, isn't it? So we have this moving back and forth between the historical and the imaginary. Propinquity, Barnes' word. You're going to get your dictionaries out here is indeed a central structuring principle of magical realist narration. What's propinquity? Thank you. Sorry. Absolutely. Oh, yes. Would you push that button and tell us your name? Thank you. Um, Zarla Williams. Yeah. Zarla? Yeah. OK. What does it mean? It means nearness. Closeness. Nearness, or uh, proximity is an easy way to remember it. It's like propinquity. That putting together side by side two things that are contradictory, the real and the magical. It's based, as we've seen now about 40 times, <laughs> on the contradictory things that can be true at once, juxtapositions of things that ordinarily in, magi in realist texts are irreconcilable. Mm? So propinquity, Barnes' word, is indeed a central structuring principle of magical realist narration. Contradictions stand face to face, ox oxymorons, contradiction in terms, write the word down if you don't have it, 
It's a literary critical term referring to a contradiction in terms. You say, Houston has great weather in the summer. You say, great weather in Houston in summer. So that's an oxymoron. You can also say it's parodic, <laughs> depending on your, or ironic, depending on your tone of voice. Contradictions stand face to face. Oxymorons march in lockstep, too predictably, Barnes insists, and politics collide with fantasy. In his reference to religion and banditry and to the miraculous impregnation of the Hacienda owner's haughty wife, clearly the kind of magical realist image he wishes would go away, Barnes implies that bad politics has become an expected ingredient of the form. His images reflect the popular perception of magical realism as a largely Latin American event. And then you know, because you've read, that this we, we contest certain of the things that Barnes is saying. And one of the things we mostly are interested in contesting in this volume is that it's just a Latin American event. Magical realism, as I said last time, is written by Toni Morrison, by Salman Rushdie, by Milan Kundera, and a lot of others. So it's not just a Latin American event. And as you know, in this class, we're going to be looking at US and Latin American writers both. But we go on, and do you want to point to some parts that are interesting to you? Do you want me to continue to walk us through it? How should we do? Do you have markings that you want to point to that seem, is it, is it too clotted, this cream, for you? <laughs> it's a little dense, perhaps, though we hope not too, of course. Um, yeah, yeah, let's see, Kathy, please. Point us to where you're interested in. I'm counting on all of you to have read it, underlined it, thought about it, and have questions about it, if you want. Yeah. Page yeah. Uh huh. I really like the whole paragraph. Oh, good. Especially talking okay. about um, like the inclusion of women, and I really like the sentence, uh, hallucinatory scenes and events. No, wait, 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 wait. We're gonna just all get there first. Tell us, uh, tell us, it's the middle paragraph on page six or, that we're looking uh -huh. at, and oh yes, it's about six lines down, seven in that paragraph. Correct. Would you go ahead? Yeah. Hallucinatory <coughs> scenes and events. Fantastic. Fantastic. Phantasmagoric characters are used in several of the magical realist works discussed here to indict recent political and cultural perversions. History is inscribed often in detail, but in such a way that actual events and existing institutions are not always privileged and are certainly not limiting. Historical narrative is no longer chronicle, but clairvoyant. Yeah, I love that line too. I actually um, read something that was similar to that in Dennis Donahue's review that I go ahead and, and cite. Um, he uses a phrase similar to that, but yes, it's chronicle. And see, it's so important because, as some of you know all too well, I teach a course. In fact, I rush off shortly to do so. I have a class that follows this one over in Roy Cullen on history, Latin American history through the novel. Latin American novels are based radically in history, and yet, A Hundred Years of Solitude never mentions the word Colombia once. It's some generic country with generic violence and the US is coming and so forth. Well, we'll see how that is. And so, so thank you for pointing that out. This, the ways in which history becomes not what happened for sure in the past, but a form even, and by clairvoyance, a form of foreseeing the future. Yeah, that's so it's important. Other things you want to point out there? You said my reference to women. Did you say something like that? Uh, right before the sentence I read. Yeah, yeah, we're going to read several women writers in this class. And it's interesting that the less realistic form, magical realism, in whatever gradation, has become very useful for women. Why? Because women have often been left out of the Western mainstream. Um, we, we're going to see Louise Erdrich, we're going to see um, Leslie Marmon Silkel, we're going to see Isabel Allende. And there's a way in which a voice is given if magic or the touchy feeliness, let's say, of, of magical realism is, is privileged. So yeah, let's just see what we said there. Um, go up one sentence before where Kathy started to read. 
do you see it? It's the second sentence of that middle paragraph on page six. Magical realist texts are subversive. Their in betweenness, their all at onceness, encourages resistance to monologic political and cultural structures, a feature that has become the mode prime, be, has made the mode particularly useful to writers in post-colonial cultures and increasingly to women. It's a way from getting out from under some of the things that are limiting, that it's all rational, that it's all logical, that it's all causal, that we can understand everything, that there's not some element of mystery that we can't possibly control. So the control thing. We're going to talk more about this next week when we look at the origins of the term. The term originates, well, for our purposes in 1925. There is a reference to it earlier, and I'll tell you about that. But what's going on in 25, 1925? Chris pointed this out after class last time. What's going on in Europe, in Germany, after, in 1925? It's post-World War I. Germany has lost World War I. It's under the terrible thumb of the Versailles Treaty. Oftentimes, when reality becomes oppressive, there's a kind of eruption of something other than that reality. So there's, we'll see that magical realism comes out of the avant-garde movements in the 20s, the teens and 20s, that are contesting the Western system. We've tried rationalism. Look what it gave us. It gave a, you know, we tried technology. We've tried machines. Look what it gave us, World War I. And of course, in Latin America, it starts later. But in Latin America, there's also the positivism the rationalism, the scientific uh, materialism of Western culture is, is gastado, it's done, it's bankrupt. So what do you do? You find another way of say, thinking and saying things. So it's subversive in those terms. It's a, it, mag magical realism, subversive. You can say, well, you know, what's a Nobel Prize? Not very subversive. I mean, the, the man has just gotten the crown of laurels of the entire literary world. What's subversive about that? He's been mainstreamed. He's been bestsellered. <laughs> you know, uh, but but there's a way in which that kind of subversion is both attractive and subversive at, at once. Um, other places you want to point to here, we've got another two or three minutes. I'm going to try always to cl close down our discussion at a quarter of one because I have to hoof it over to Roy Cullen and get my head or on straight for the next class, as I'm sure you all do. You have to run to the next class too. But we have a couple more minutes. Anybody want to point to other things? Let me point to one. Anybody? Did I preempt you there? There's a, a paragraph that for me is important, and again, it's to reinforce what's already been said in a certain way, in many ways, in these two classes, as we work toward a kind of flexible definition of this term. Page three, the, the middle paragraph. This is where we started yesterday or day before. We can't understand magical realism until we've understood realism. We can't understand what magical realism is up against, is contesting, is subverting, if we don't know what realism is, because that's what's being contested and subverted. And so I do it in this paragraph. We do it in this paragraph. And if you'll bear with me, I want to read it to you. Um, the words ideological and hegemonic, or hegemonically, will come up. Hegemonic, you know, hegemony means power control. It means you're on top. A hegemonic power is one that has all the power. It, so hegemony is usually coded, coded negative. If you say to someone you're being very hegemonic, it doesn't usually be, it's not usually taken as a compliment. So, so I, I warn you about that word in this in this paragraph. Um, but let's just do the whole thing here. An essential difference then between realism and magical realism involves the intentionality implicit in the conventions of the two modes. Now here we used a two-bit word when we could have used a one-bit word maybe. I mean we could have said intention. Intentionality is a philosophical way of saying intention. That intentionality is a system of intentions. What is intended? What is meant by something? So I'm saying that the intentionality of the two things, realism and magical realism, are utterly distinct. Several essays in our collection suggest that realism intends its version of the world, it intends its version of the world as a singular version. 
as an objective, hence universal, representation of natural and social realities. In short, that realism functions ideologically and hegemonically. There's only one way to think about reality. There's no way in which, you know, there's a question about whether an angel is an angel or a man or a hawk or an airplane. No. That's a man. And if they're angels, well, and there usually aren't in realistic fiction, uh, they're called angels. Whereas magical realism, see, I'm, the, we've done the realism, this universalizing singular vision of the way reality works. Second, magical realism also functions ideologically. We've just seen a nice ideological reading of uh, like water for chocolate. No, uh, light is like water. But according to these essays, less hegemonically. Mag magical realism is less hegemonic, for its program is not centralizing, but eccentric. It creates space for interactions of diversity. In magical realist texts, ontological disruption, we'll come back to that, serves the purpose of political and cultural disruption. Magic is often given as a cultural corrective requiring readers to scrutinize accepted realistic conventions of causality, materiality, motivation. We've been talking about this paragraph the whole time, this whole day. That's, those are the ideas that we've been playing with based on, on our terms. I'm going to let you go, and we'll see you on Tuesday. And we'll look at the essays that are assigned, please. Thank you.